you've joined us. We'll start by singing Living by Faith. I care not today what the marble may be, the shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is Away, the 
on that blessed heavenly shore, living by faith in Jesus above. Amen. We can live by faith, even in the darkest of times. In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face, while the storm howls about me, and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over. Till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no wind of sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise, where the storm never darkens the skies. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When the long night has ended, and the storms come no more. Let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Because of his faithfulness, his love, his grace, his mercy, we glorify his name. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the Glorify thy name, glorify thy name. 
come to you right now and we give you glory and honor and praise. We ask that in everything we do, say, and think that you may gain glory. Help us, Lord, not to seek the glory for ourselves, but instead to rest in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this evening is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to re be reading uh, verses 1 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Before we read the scripture, let me just note that from almost as early as we can remember in life, we have wanted to be bigger, stronger, more beautiful, more skilled at something or even everything in life. When I was a kid, one of our favorite games was King of the Mountain. We kids would find some mound of dirt or a little rise on the ground and we would compete to see who could stay at the top the longest. We wanted to be king. We competed in basketball, in baseball, everything. We even competed in schoolwork, trying to get the best grades. Now, when I was very young, the favorite game at school was hide and seek. My two best friends and I would work together to get back to base safely. It was a great competition with whoever was it. Once, however, I decided that I would hide so well that no one would find me. And I did. They played through several rounds of different people being uh, it before I finally emerged from my hiding place. My elation at being so well hidden was somewhat deflated, however, when uh, everyone told me that they didn't even realize I had disappeared. <sighs> Little boys but long before they hit puberty, start flexing their muscles. They want to be the strongest, the biggest, the baddest, the best. We grow up with this worldly way of thinking that success is being the smartest, the strongest, the one with the most toys, and on and on it goes. And we live our lives by this premise. As adults, we fight and claw for the top position at the workplace. We show off our homes, our cars, and our boats. We compete in sports, and if we do not compete in playing sports, we often compete in our knowledge of the game. We compete on social media. We fill our Facebook and Instagram accounts with glamorous photos and posts about ourselves, our families, our hobbies, everything. Even Christians often operate by this worldly way of thinking. This is what was happening in Corinth Church. In Corinth Church, the believers were competing to see who was the most spiritual. They divided into factions, idolizing various Christian personalities determined by who they thought was the most spiritual, whether it was Peter or Paul or Apollos. And of course, the most spiritual of these factions claimed Jesus as their idol. These Christians competed in worship services, vying to be heard speaking in other languages. 
It would appear that even the hymns, prophecies, and revelations brought by various ones were often delivered in competition to one another. Furthermore, there was competition with Paul himself as an apostle. Throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul defended various aspects of his ministry. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul resorted to the tactic of boasting to defend himself. He never noted the utter foolishness of boasting, but he proceeded to boast of his spirituality in order to make a point. One of the issues that he had to deal with were teachers in Corinth church who claimed to have had these revelations from God. And due to these spiritual experiences, they refused to acknowledge Paul's authority as an apostle. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, Paul continued his boasting, telling of his own revelation. Would you read it with me? He writes, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself will I not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In these verses, Paul speaks of himself in the third person. It would appear that Paul spoke of himself as if it were someone else for the sake of modesty. This wonderful vision of God was too great for him to glory in. In these verses are some details that we should take notice of. In verse 2, Paul says that he was caught up to the third heaven. What exactly was the third heaven? Jewish literature of that time speaks of a multi-layered heaven or sky above the earth with God in the highest layer. The ascension of Isaiah, a Jewish work, thinks of the sky in terms of seven layers. The Testament of Levi speaks of three layers of sky, just as Paul does. Just as we are not talking about cosmology, when we speak of the sun rising or setting, Paul was simply using a certain Jewish way of referring to God's location. In other words, Paul's statement that he was taken up into paradise or the third heaven is his way of saying that he went into the very presence of God. Paul was in the very presence of God in heaven? Wow! Verse 4 says that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. By unspeakable words, Paul was not saying that he could not understand what he was, what he heard. Rather, he was saying that what he heard in heaven is not permissible for to be spoken by man on earth. The various people in Corinth competing with Paul, claiming to have received some revelation, may have had some spiritual experience, wonderful experience. But Paul's experience was much greater than theirs. Yet notice that Paul did not speak of this experience until some 14 or more years later, after it occurred, and only because he was driven to boasting as a defense of his ministry. I think we can agree that Paul's spiritual experience trumped anything that the other teachers, the other people had seen. His experience most likely still trumps anything that we have experienced or seen. As we continue reading our text, however, we find that Paul's boast was not in this wonderful experience, 
but in something completely different. Beginning at, uh, at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Paul's boast was not in his trance in which he was in the very presence of God. Whether in the body or not, he was unsure. Paul's boast was in a thorn. What was this thorn in the flesh that was given to Paul? Very simply, we don't know. Endless suggestions have been made. Three proposals are feasible. One, Paul had a physical ailment, perhaps an eye disease or a speech impediment. Two, Paul spoke of continuing opponents in the churches. Three, Paul pointed to some troubling demonic activity, perhaps some severe temptation. Whatever this thorn was, we should understand that it was not a minor irritant. This thorn troubled Paul greatly. The word thorn in the Greek signified any pointed peg or piece of metal or wood, and therefore it is possible that Paul pictured this thorn not merely the thorn on the stem of a rose bush, but like one of the spikes with which Jesus was crucified. Paul's point of describing whatever this was as a thorn was probably not about the pain that it caused, even though it did cause him great pain. But his point was about how this thorn was an instrument of death in his life. It was an obstacle to his ministry. Consider firstly the purpose of God in our thorns. Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul called this thorn the messenger of Satan? Whatever this thorn was, it was not something like something that could be ignored. No, Paul recognized its source as satanic. This thorn was given to him. Note that Paul did not say that God had given him this thorn. Regardless, God allowed Paul to experience this thorn. This thorn was the will of God. Or at least it was in the, in the will of God. No, the thorn, whether it's some physical difficulty, opponents in the church, some reoccurring temptation, this thorn was not a good thing. But Paul, God had a purpose in allowing this thorn to trouble Paul. God used this thorn to keep Paul's ego in check lest other people might begin to exalt Paul beyond being a mere servant of Christ. God allowed this thorn to remain so that Paul might be brought back down to earth. As we've considered Paul's experience, both his vision of God and the nagging, painful thorn in his side, do you feel like you can relate? Is there something in your life that feels like a thorn? Have you questioned God, why he would allow that thorn to remain. Have you ever considered the fact 
that God may have a purpose for the thorn in your life, that long-lasting physical illness. You don't understand why God won't heal you. You don't understand his purpose for your life. But this thorn in your life is his will for you. Those people who oppose you, despite everything you've done to try to please them, to be reconciled with them, they continue to be a thorn in your side. You don't understand why. But could it be that God has a purpose for you in this opposition? That debilitating temptation. You want to be victorious. You do your best to serve Christ. And through Christ's power, you are victorious. We should understand that even if a temptation is a thorn, we can be victorious over temptation. The, 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 the idea of it being a thorn is that you're tempted severely and you're tempted again and again and you wish you could remove the source of the temptation, but for whatever reason, it's impossible. Could God have a purpose in allowing you to experience this trial of your faith. In verse 9, we find secondly, the power of God in our thorns. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We should note carefully the promise of God to Paul. Notice that Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul would not be able to go on in life and ministry with this thorn on his own strength. Paul had to receive the grace of Jesus. But notice also that Christ's grace was sufficient. More than sufficient for Paul's need. Paul did not need to worry if God could get him through he did not need to worry that God's grace might run out. The grace of God is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Whose strength is made perfect? It was not Paul's strength that was made perfect. If you have a red letter Bible, notice that all these words are in red. In other words, Jesus is speaking, and he is speaking about himself. I'm concerned that sometimes Christians look to this verse and read it saying, my strength, their personal strength, is made perfect in their weakness. What Jesus said is this, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. We must be weak in order for his strength and his power to be displayed in us. It's right here that I'm afraid that the church in the Western world fails to experience the power of Christ in our lives today. When we ask each other how we are doing, what do we answer? We tend to say, I'm okay, I'm blessed, I'm thankful. And this may all be true. But the truth often is that we are not all right. We are struggling spiritually with temptation or discouragement, distraction, maybe unwillingness to give and serve for Christ. We have uh, struggles in our family, struggles at school, struggles at work, and we may not be on speaking terms with someone else in the church. But we don't want to be seen as weak. And so we toughen up and we say, I'm doing well, praise God. And because we are not weak, the power of Christ is not perfected in us. For those who, like Paul, will acknowledge their weakness and infirmity, however, the power of Jesus is experienced. No, they do not live by their own ability. They do not rely on themselves for strength. They don't have to fight and claw. They simply rest in the power of Christ, working in and through them. The result is, thirdly, the pleasure in God 
despite our thorns. Verses 9 and 10. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The word rest in verse 9 is amazing. The terminology translated rest may be translated as to tabernacle or pitch a tent. It is likely that Paul was drawing upon Old Testament imagery of the glory of God coming down upon the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness. And if so, he learned that taking delight in his thorn actually brought the blessings of God upon his life. Can you picture it? When God led the Israelites out of Egypt, instead of taking them on a direct path northeast through the promised land, he took them southeast through the desert. The Israelites could have reached the promised land in about a month's time of traveling. But God knew that they were not ready. They were not ready to worship him only. They were not ready to fight with overcoming faith. They were not ready to be a light to the Gentiles. And so God took them into the desert where they would grow thirsty and hungry and despair and be discouraged. God took them to a place where they would have to depend on him. God wanted them to learn to trust him with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Many years later, it was almost time for the Son of God to begin his earthly ministry. The forerunner, John the Baptist, proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus was baptized. The Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of the dove, and the Father spoke from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But what did the Spirit immediately do? He drove Jesus into the wilderness, where he would fast for 40 days and nights, learning to depend on the Father. The devil came with glittering, enticing proposals, but Jesus quoted the word of God and said, No. And Jesus went from there in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is it that we so often think that we can be used of God without being hurt by God? Why do we rest in our own power? Why do we do our best to avoid the thorns of life? Why do we complain and argue with God about his will? It is when we are weak that Christ is made strong in us. And so while it doesn't make sense according to the world's way of thinking, we can truly take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Whether you are dealing with a personal weakness, with insults from others, hardships in life, persecution, some calamity in life, you can be happy, you can take joy. You can find pleasure in all of these bad things. No, these bad things are not good things. But in the midst of your weakness, your powerlessness, Christ in you gives you strength. And so you become strong. Our weakness allows God's power to be displayed in us. Our scripture teaches this truth convincingly. You can't escape this conclusion. Our weakness allows God's power to be displayed in us. The question is, do you understand 
this truth. Yes, from our youngest days, we learn to compete. We compete in games, we compete in school, in work, even in the church. Life is all about being the smartest, the most beautiful, the hardest working, the most successful, the richest. But it is only in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties that Christ's power is realized in us. Yes, I know. We don't like being weak. We don't want to take insults without responding in some way. We are afraid of hardship. Persecution terrifies us. We don't want difficulty. We don't want COVID-19. We want a Christian journey that is user-friendly and free of any inconvenience. But it is in our weakness and limitations that Christ's power can be displayed. As such then, there is great purpose in our weaknesses. Yes, your weakness, your failures, your setbacks are used by God for a purpose if you will cooperate with his will. Yes, pr Paul prayed for the thorn to be removed. He prayed repeatedly. And we should also, we can pray and pray that God will deliver us from these difficulties that we are experiencing in life. But if God chooses to say, no, I want this difficulty to remain in your life for a season or for the rest of your life. We should accept this limitation. We should accept this weakness as God's will for us. We should realize that God is allowing this to be part of our life for a reason. The challenge then is, is this. Embrace weakness so that Christ's power can be displayed in you. Will you do this? Will you embrace your weaknesses, your hardships? Will you rejoice because you know that when you have no strength, Christ's power can be displayed magnificently through you? This is our challenge as followers of Jesus. Embrace your thorns so that Christ's power can be displayed in you. I'm going to close in prayer, but... After we pray, we are going to meet in Zoom for a time of sharing and prayer. And as we meet in Zoom, I'm going to just ask you if you would want to identify thorns in your life, difficulties that God is allowing you to go through and you don't see any way, see any way out of them. And then I'm going to ask you to, if you may see that God has a purpose to display his power through your weakness. And then we'll pray together. Let us pray. Father, we don't like weakness. We like to be strong. We don't like depending on others. We don't like hardships and difficulties. We don't like insults. We are deathly afraid of persecution. So many are afraid during this time of COVID-19 because of the weakness, the sickness, the hardship and difficulty. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that you have a purpose for allowing difficulties in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize that it is in our weakness that you're made strong. So Lord, I, I pray that uh, we would even embrace our thorns so that in our weakness, your power might be displayed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.